Hello there everyone. Of I am of course Steve with Retro Tech and today I've got a special just Q&A session for you guys. I thought I'd have a cool backdrop with the 20L5 and the JVC um, compo component set up here with the two TVs. This is of course the JVC D-Series 36 inch and the PVM 20L5. And I wanted to go through a lot of the questions I've been getting over the last couple weeks because I've really been busy. I'm sorry. I know I've come out with a lot of videos and I get a lot of questions after that. And I don't really have a lot of time right now to do it because um, retro tech's just kind of a side thing currently. And uh, maybe eventually we'll get to what we can do later, you know, as far as the channel growing and maybe a Patreon account eventually to help. Um, with really quick service, you know, if you need specific service on your monitors and help specifically uh, because I just don't have time to sit there and just do it. A lot of times it takes me a couple days to get back to a lot of questions. So today I wanted to say, of course, thank you for hitting us or hitting me to 1,500 subscribers now. Uh, we're almost to 1,600, somewhere in the middle there. Um, the channel's been around for a couple months, maybe three months and uh, some of the videos have really gotten a lot of good feedback so as long as it's still helpful and I feel like uh, I can help the retro gaming community or even just the retro um, technologies uh, sector I'm glad to do it so enough of that let's just jump right in here and get to your questions because I got a couple pages worth I'll try to time it out this video might be a two-parter uh, but let's just go ahead and get started First question, now this is a question I got asked a couple times and I finally, you know, I figured it would have been asked last time but it hadn't been asked to this point. Have you ever been shocked? And if so, what's the worst shock you've experienced? So um, I have been shocked. I've been shocked a couple times. I've never been shocked directly from the energy that is stored in the back of the tube. So on the opened back CRT, you've got the, uh, the anode cap, which goes directly into the back of the CRT. We've seen it a lot in videos. And that's, if it's turned on, then there's especially energy going into that tube and it's building up inside there. And that's why you hear like when you turn it on, it takes a second for the phosphors to show. It's just that electricity builds up in there. And if it's been off for a long time, a lot of that discharges out. Uh, so that's where a lot of that electricity is stored. It comes from the flyback directly, but I've not been shocked by that directly because I've always been very cautious around that. Uh, the uh, things I have been shocked by is um, grounding out a board component, um, either with something I'm touching with my other hand, which is a bad practice of ever using both your hands on something. Um, it's never a big zap. It's like a little uh, jolt. Um, the worst I ever had was most of the time, I mean, I might get a little zap working on a neck board or something while it's in operation, and that's not nearly bad. The only time it kind of hurts is if you're touching something else and it goes through your chest, then that hurts. <laughs> but again, nothing dangerous, nothing that's put me, even made me really stop working. Uh, but 2030s, the Sony PVM 2030s are the worst to work on. Uh, I don't think you can adjust the convergence. Uh, potentiometer on the back of the neck board just by hand you have to make some kind of tool because it is so hard or you have to do it while it's turned off and turn the monitor back on and off and on and off same thing with the yoke adjustment on that monitor it's brutally awful and it, um, it it's so tight in there you stick your arm in there and it, it shorts out against the uh, metal frames or the, the the boards in the area and so you'll have a shot go through your hand and I did have a cut on my hand one time where made my hand pull back and I caught it on the side of uh, the frame and it scratched my hand pretty bad. And that's the worst shock. Uh, most injuries, and this is not just from me, from CRTs, is from lifting them pr improperly or overlifting them too much and hurting your back. I've definitely hurt my back more than, uh, that hurts worse than the shock because the shock goes away pretty quickly. But I've never been shocked directly from the uh, bad part of the flyback CRT uh, or the, uh, uh, anode cap. I have talked to people and read about people that have been shocked and, and it's pretty bad but it doesn't actually, you know, I've never heard of anybody, again, um, I've never seen anybody directly dying from it. Uh, I, if, you, if you find the information, please post it below. Um, 
All right, so let's get back to these questions. That was kind of a long one to start with, but uh, you, uh, Machiwa, sorry if I don't know how to say that, but it's um, a question here. I've got a couple of 20 L2s or 14 L2s that have been in storage for a while and they've developed some faults. One is geometry is off on the right hand side. And um, anyway, there's a contrast problem with the grays on the other one. Do you think this might be a yoke adjustment on the first and a recap might help? If uh, the first thing you want to do when you get a monitor is uh, open it up, inspect inside, and see if there's a lot of dust again. So clean it out if there is a lot of dust. If you get the monitor and you're familiar with tearing it down and doing a recap, then you could, and then you're just avoiding everything else. You can then go into the calibration steps next, and that will probably be the best procedure. If you're not, if you don't have the right equipment and you don't have the experience to recap, a uh, CRT. I don't recommend you do it. You kind of just have to live with the faults maybe that are in it and do the uh, much adjustments um, that you can from its current state. Because not all the time, it's not all the time that a capacitor goes bad and um, it could go out of spec a little bit, but then you can use the geometry settings to put it back in spec sometimes. And that's why you have a lot of settings on the PVMs and the BVMs available so that you can adjust those settings and uh, get it back into a spec. So my thing is, is if you're comfortable and you want to tear it down and go ahead and do the recap, that's going to be the best thing. It's going to add a lot of value to your PVMs when it gets, once it gets finished because it's a fully refurbished PVM at that point. Uh, it's also going to eliminate any future problems you'll have that come down the road possibly. Uh, and you'll be able to calibrate it after that and get it into its best shape. But you can go ahead and, you know, if you're not that experienced with that stuff or you have a hard time finding anybody in your area that can do a recap, um, by all means, try to calibrate it as best you can through the service menu and the other adjustments we've tried in my past videos. Bob Wagle asks, I've heard that using a degauss coil um, on a Trinitron has potential to damage the grill, the aperture grill. Is there any truth to that? It wouldn't seem likely since it has the external degausser um, and the inner one, but I'm no expert. So I've never actually heard of that, uh, a degaussing wand or degaussing coil actually causing any damage to a CRT. Um, it's not actually, the degaussing wand doesn't send out a huge signal that would be damaging. It kind of sends out a constant vibration in a certain pattern so that while you're waving that wand it just spreads out your electrons more and you back up and that's just, it's just a process so I don't really think it could damage a CRT I've never I've never seen a warning about it and I've used uh, I've got a really high powerful wand I've used on tons of CRTs and I've never had it do anything negatively to it uh, so I, I would use one with confidence if you need one uh, OJ Taylor asks hi I have a 20M2 MDE. I'm happy with the geometry except the corners are slightly bowed outwards and he says he's wondering what ideas he would have to fix. He said he's tried to use the pin settings on the two four and the 240p test suite. Um, he's tried to use his pin settings in his geometry but he's still having issues. Sometimes you can have your capacitors go out in your deflection board on your pin settings and then you make an adjustment and it, and it just doesn't make the adjustment. Or if you make an adjustment, the adjustment goes out of whack within a, an hour or something. It can just happen and that means your capacitors could be failing. You also could be check the convergence strips in the corners and wiggle them a little bit before you remove them and reseat them. Uh, those are the strips. We've done a lot of videos on those strips. Uh, but those could be an issue. But he also said here that he's using his PVM for 480i content, which doesn't seem to show as much geometry problems. And I will note that you're definitely going to see a lot less geometry issues on a 480i signal on your PVM than you ever would on a um, 240p signal. The 240p signal just shows everything. It's, it's not laced over or filtered. It's all straight up. What you see is what you get. And the CRT is going to draw it however the best the CRT is set up. So... If you're only using 480i content most of the time, which again, CRTs are great for, that's what we're playing on this loop right here, is 480i content through component, 
through a PS2, uh, that is, you can see just a lot less worries on anything ge geometry wise on the screen. So that, I wanted to point that out, so that was a good comment and question. Okay. Let's continue here. Where did you get the calibration tool? Uh, this is from Digital Dirigibles. Um, you're running, uh, thanks. So my recommendation, if you're doing 240p, I've used a lot of different um, consoles, but in my videos, you'll see me using this, the SNES. And this one is a SNES junior model. And what it is is basically it's the one chip model and it had to be modified. Um, I did use Voltar's mod board for this, the higher end 7374 chip is in there, which is supposed to give it extra clarity. It's been recapped. Um, and then that console is running through a straight up C-Sync SCART head into the monitors usually. Or I'll use components sometimes. This one also does S-Video and um, Composite too. So if I want to test those other inputs, I'll still use this because again, this gives me the best 240p signal out of anything I've tried. Uh, and then the cartridge is the SD to SNES cartridge with the 240p test suite loaded on here. And that's just a ROM that I've linked to in many videos. It's very popular, very good. I've used other consoles to calibrate with and not had the best success when you switch to another console. And even with this, you're gonna switch over to other things and it won't be perfect. You'll have to over scan, you'll have to move around the vertical and horizontal, uh, horizontal um, geometry sweeps on your screen sometimes just to make sure that you're fully capturing all the picture um, and you don't have any black lines on the sides of your picture quality on your screen. So that's, the, that's what I use and that's what I recommend if you're doing 480i content, I would recommend using um, probably a high quality DVD player and some kind of high quality DVD that you get even more test patterns than the 240p test suite has. And um, those are pretty cheap. There's a bunch of them on eBay and Amazon that, that are just DVDs that you can make and get for uh, relatively nothing. Okay, I need a good screen name asked. JVC TV question. I was at Goodwill a few days ago and found a D-Series in mint condition, hooked it up and everything looked amazing. And of course I walk away and had uh, heard a couple say it was just working. Um, basically he left to get his truck and within 15 minutes it was gone. And he's still been looking at some uh, other CRTs that are consumer level CRTs and what would my suggestions be for consumer CRTs? I've got the JVC, I've also got a Toshiba that's great. My biggest um, concerns with CRTs, uh, first off, is I don't even look at them if they're flat screen usually and a consumer grade. Uh, I want it to be in the 4x3 format always. I want it to have the curved screen pretty much always if I can get it like that and I'm looking for things that have component input and that's just the start. And then from there I'm going to look at what other things it has as far as size and then the screen quality you want to test it out and just see make sure it works and see how it looks right away uh, if it's nice and bright and doesn't need a lot of adjustments then usually I feel like it's a good worthy investment. I would never spend probably right now over $50 on even a highest end uh, CRT, maybe a hundred. If it's something that you really want, it's in great condition. Uh, but even one day, these things are gonna be harder to come by and they're gonna be desired from people. So um, like he said, even people that are just looking for a cheap way to do TV, cause you can run things into this that still, as long as it downscales to 480i, then it's something that's good and it's great for retro games and relatively cheap, if you're, especially if you're trying to get into this hobby and you can't, um, I recommend always getting one of these if you're gonna start, rather than just jumping right into a PVM because those are so much more expensive and they require a lot more tedious work. You have to be sure that that's what you wanna do. And speaking of expensive, F3 Real Warrior asked, how much do these go for nowadays? He was talking about the 20L5 and I just thought I'd go with that and other PVMs. You know, 20L5s are on eBay all day for $1,200 pretty much shipped. 
Um, that's a decently working condition one. I don't believe that includes the ones I've seen on there. They don't ever seem to show pictures of the inside. I'm not assuming that they're cleaned. They may be calibrated uh, according to the 240p test suite, but um, you just have to ask the sellers. Uh, I feel like this 20L5, if you can get one for a thousand bucks or less, and it's working great, you fix it up, clean it up, test it, make sure it's good, I feel like that's a good investment. I feel like honestly, this, this monitor could still go up to easily hit $2,000 again on the price market on what it's worth. Um, other PVMs, you're looking at the f uh, three to $600 range based on the quality of the screens most of the time, the 600 line monitors, their quality. Um, you gotta think about shipping too. Shipping is a real challenge and probably biggest way you can save on a PVM is if you can avoid shipping because it's almost $200 to pack and ship a 20 inch PVM safely from uh, most areas just in the United States. Uh, it's about 165 to $200 total to pack and ship it properly. So that's a, that's a good idea on the prices there. Okay, uh, KWK Box. 20L5 monitor is a centerpiece of all gaming. It uses component and lower. It's close to perfect. Uh, I wish I had an hours tracker in the BIOS though. So I wanted to bring that up because yeah, there is no BIOS hours tracker in any PVM. That's a BVM only thing. Uh, I think that's because the BVM probably has a bigger OSD or operating system and it was included in that. And even though the 2005 is extremely close to a BVM in performance, I feel like that's something they probably just left out because it's pretty much the same exact um, operating system menu as a 20L2. Let's keep going here. Revolu, will you be planning on sharing a capacitor list needed to do a recap on 20L5? Um, he's a lot talking about that and then some other models in M2, uh, but not really seeing anybody have a L5 cap list readily available. So eventually I'm going to do that, but you can see my 20L5 doesn't need it. Um, so I've got three other monitors that need to be internally repaired. Two of them need full cap replacements. So the first one I'm going to do is an Olympus 14-inch monitor, and that's going to be exactly equal to the Sony 14M2. And I'll go through the whole process of from taking it apart to recap to putting it back together and calibration on it. Uh, I'm going to restore it fully and it's going to be another centerpiece kind of item, but um, I do plan on doing an L5 cap list, cap replacement, but that's a really tough one. I hope you saw my last couple videos looking at the inside of the 20 L5. There's a lot of tight spaces in there and it's just something I have to take apart fully and be safe with. So I'm not going to go ahead and jump into it until I can clear out some space and get ready to uh, have the full amount of time just to work on that one. Once I get the others finished, the other two recaps done, we'll work on that. Okay, so let me just check our time here for this and I'll take, and we're gonna do um, one, a couple more and then we'll go and I'll have to break this up into another video probably tomorrow where I'll just put down another 15 minute or so video going through all the questions. Alex Jenkins, I had a great conversation with Alex Jenkins. First off, he told me a lot about his dad who used to work in the CRT business uh, kind of as a customer service and field rep uh, engineer that went out and um, would service monitors in the field and set them up. And it was just a great conversation. I think it uh, put a lot of passion into his love for um, CRTs and I totally get it. I think they're a nostalgic piece of history at this point. And um, I just love that story. But he also then had some questions about the 129X. Uh, the 129X is a BKM Sony input card. It works in the 20L5. It's what I'm using right now to do the component loop. Uh, so it does component in RGB and it's additional. It goes in the slot in the back of uh, this monitor. It also goes in 20L2s, 14L2s, 20L5s. But there's some BVMs it works in, in the D-series, D9, D14s, and um, I think that's about it. The bigger D-series needs a bigger card. So uh, it's a pretty uh, good board that goes across. It has, still has some value, so if you see one, grab one. And um, you would want one on this monitor. It's not going to give you any more resolution than the other input would, but it is a secondary input and uh, adds a good secondary input in case you want to do component and RGB from the same monitor. And then Retro Gaming Boy 
Gamer Boy left a note about the 2005, how it supports 1080i. That's amazing. I said, yeah, that is pretty amazing. I showed a video uh, yesterday or two days ago where we showed a demo of this thing going it all the way up to 1080i. That is incredible. Uh, Scott Hayfele, sorry if I say anything wrong. My 2030 is from the early 80s, by the way. I think most 